Let's go. So welcome to uh, On on the Path uh, Presents Out Loud podcast. We are fortunate to have uh, Jaime Gomez, who has uh, been in the movie industry and uh, has been a leading man and everything in between for a, a lot of years now, has a lot of expertise in the, in the movie business and the stage business and uh, um, has done producing and acting for a long time. We're really glad to have Jaime on. He's got a new project that we're going to talk about and uh, Thanks a lot, Jaime Gomez, for coming on with us, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank you, man. My pleasure. Absolutely, it's uh, good to be here. Well, we're we're just. I, I think that I think what we'd like to do is get a little bit of uh, just an idea. You know, the, we we've talked to to several people in the business, and and one of the things that's the most fascinating is kind of what what where did it all start? You know, where did you start getting the idea that you wanted to be in this business, and 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 then what kind of steps and progression did you have going forward? Sure. Um, I think, I think everything for me comes from, you know, from the literature, from the word. Uh, I've always been an avid reader. When I was a kid, I was always reading above my level. That's kind of been my escape. My release is getting lost in literature. And uh, uh, when I went to, when I went to St. Paul freshman year, I had sister Ruth and she was like, she forced me to read every single morning. And I was like, sister, I'm not really feeling it, man. She's like, you're reading DH, <laughs> DH Lawrence, you know, you're reading out loud to the rest out of the loud class. to the rest of the class. Wow. And I was just like panicked because that was one thing I've never felt comfortable doing. And it's, it's, it was a big deal, right? So I'd read and I'd lose my place and people in class would be like, what the hell is he reading? And I just keep on reading and charging <laughs> through it because I was just like freaked out. But she introduced me, you know, to, to Hemingway and Pirandello and D.H. Lawrence and all these great, amazing writers. So I just kind of took off from there. And then uh, beginning of senior year, um, do you remember Miss Ramshaw? I do, yeah. Oh, yeah. Miss Ramshaw was like the most beautiful teacher at St. Paul. I mean, just, <laughs> just this beautiful woman. And I walked into her English class and there was nobody in the class, but one person. And the English final was on her desk. <laughs> and I looked around and I just real casually just grabbed five pages, put it in my coat, went and sat down. And the girl who was there, I don't even, I can't remember who it was. She just kind of looked at me I didn't think anything of it, but after that, of course, I went and sold the test and, you know, <laughs> sold them for five bucks a, a pop. And then about, about That'll be 10 days, Hail Marys, Jaime. That'll be 10 <laughs> Hail Marys. Yeah, 10,000. Wait till you hear the rest of the story. So uh, a couple of days later, I'm sitting in class and Miss Ramshaw walks in. I'm in uh, history class or something. And she's walking across the front of the class and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's so gorgeous. And then she turns and she's got tears in her eyes. And she's coming right towards me. I'm like, oh no. She goes, go to the deed's office. Go to the deed. And I was like, oh no. Oh no. What happened? Because of course I'd forgotten. It's been like two days, right? <laughs> but I went to the dean's office and I'm standing there. I'm like, what's going on? What's this all about? He goes, look, I'm going to cut the BS because he was like a family member because I was in the dean's office like all the time. <laughs> and he says, uh, he goes, look, I know you stole the test. I just want to know that you didn't sell it to anybody. And I was standing there and my pockets were bulging with $5 bills. <laughs> I'll never forget. I sat down and I said, I would never do that. Of course not. I did it just for myself. and just like went off on this whole web of <laughs> deceit, right? Of why I had to get a good grade. Well, I can take two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. right. So I went on and he was just like, all right, just get out of my class. Get out. I mean, get out of the office, wait in the hallway there. So I got kicked out of that class, out of uh, Miss Ramshaw's class, and I got put into a Shakespeare class where we had to read all of Shakespeare's plays. Wow. So that was my punishment. So as soon as I got there, I was like, wow, man, the Shakespeare's really cool. Yeah. Got into it. They, uh, Mrs. Dwyer made me play Hamlet and Romeo and Othello, and she gave me all the, you know, as a punishment to read all the stuff. And I just loved it. I ate it up. So long story short, I went from there I went to Rio Hondo and that was right when computers went from drawing to, I mean, when drafting went from drawing to computers. Like, nope. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do the math. 
I didn't know what to do. Looking through the, through the booklet, I saw principles of acting and they were doing scenes from Shakespeare. So I was like, I'm going to give that a shot. So that's how I started. I went and I did that class and uh, it was amazing. The teacher asked me to be an extra in a walk-on. Uh, they were doing Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, one of their former students was a guy named Danny Delapaz. He'd been in the movie Barbarossa. He starred in Boulevard Nights. He was like a local Whittier kind of movie star guy. And uh, uh, I met him there, but being backstage, hearing the people come in, and I remember looking out at the curtain and seeing everybody come in and it was just like, whoosh. I said, this is what I want to do now. This wow. is it. That's cool. Yeah, so that, that totally swept me away. Danny Delapaz was studying with a woman named Joanne Barron who just came out here from New York. Uh, she studied for 10 years with Bill Esberg who started with Sanford Meisner who came from the neighborhood playhouse. Wow. And she was this little five foot two Jewish woman who was just like a maniac. I mean, she would punch holes in the walls, right? Well, she, he, he said, I'll get you a meeting with her, right? She took, she accepted 10 men and 10 women out of the 300 applicants. And I was one of the, one of the people that got picked. So I was able to study in her class. I rode the bus from Whittier out to Hollywood, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, three times a week. And I did a theater training program and finish that. And then right when I got out, I started working and that's how it all started. What was the thing that you went? Yeah, if I wouldn't have got in with her, I would have never known or understood this concepts or whatever. Was there something that was pivotal in your, in your you know, what you learned from her and, and? Sure, it was the discipline. You know, you couldn't be late. You couldn't be absent. You couldn't work. If you left, missed a class or you were late, you were kicked out immediately no questions asked and it was uh it was the the meisner training which is about answering and listening everything about great acting is reacting what it forces you to do is really listen to the way people are treating you and the way they're talking to you now you know i grew up my parents got a divorce when i was in seventh grade there was a lot of turmoil there my brothers and sisters were 10 years older than me so i was very much on my own, and that's why I was retreated to books. That was my, my safe place, right? But my dad was a ex-Marine, just total badass, you know, badass <laughs> dude, mean as a, as a junkyard dog. And everything he said, you could end it with asshole, you know? Did you clean your room? You know, where are you going, asshole? <laughs> did, you, did you, you know, wash the car, asshole? So when I did this training, I started to listen. I listened to the way people talk to me at the store or the way I was talking to my girlfriend or to my mother. And then one day I just confronted him. I said, stop talking to me like that. All right. I don't deserve that. So it changed me as a, as a human being, it made me more perceptive to what I'm putting out there and what I'm taking wow. in. Wow, that's and cool. that's what really changed because when I was doing the acting, going to auditions, I wasn't worried about my show, you know? I knew my lines, I knew what I wanted to do. I just put all my attention on you. What are you gonna say? Right. What you say is gonna make me say what I'm going to say. And that was kind of the magic of it that allowed it to flow. It's kind of counterintuitive because you're, you're putting yourself out there, you're extroverted to stand on the stage, but then you gotta quiet down, dummy up and listen to be a great actor. It's what a, what a fascinating struggle that must be inside of you every night. That's always been my biggest dilemma. I don't like reading in front of people. I don't like doing interviews. I don't like, you know, I'm really antisocial. I don't like hanging out. I don't, I don't do, you know, I, I like to read and do my own thing. So it's like every, every performance is a challenge of that greatest fear, you know, and that's the mountain I climb and have to climb every time I do it. Oh, and cool. it's like, woo, you yeah. know, it's a rush. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Is it therapeutic, Jaime? Mean? Is it like a therapy? Yeah, it's finding it, out who you are and yeah, what you're all about. Self-actualization about how I feel about you. Because everything's about relationships, right? You do a scene with somebody you don't know. Well, I've got to know that this guy who I just met, he's my brother, man. I've known him for 25 years. <laughs> We're in the trenches together. So I have to know how I feel about that guy. Right. And that's what every the first year, like I said, self-actualization is coming to how you feel because you get invited for a second year. 
some people are, are disconnected, you know, some people showed up high, some people, you know, they just weren't ever going to get there. So you bring that, those real true truthful meanings to the words in a scene. When you say, I love you, it's love that you have for somebody you really love. It's real emotion in an imaginary circumstance. So it very much is therapy. Wow. And it's, it's, it, it, I've also been someone who's always really emotional too. So it gave a great channel for my emotions and to express myself, you know, in, cool. in a, in a big I, I need to start acting. I mean, I got to get some. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Tom, you've been acting all your life. Yeah. I'm acting like a podcaster right about now. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I think everyone should know that out there in the hemisphere that we all went to the same high school. We weren't there at the same time, but we all went to the same. Cause we keep saying these, making these connections and it's like, well, we all went to the same school. So sure. we know. So what was, what was the next step then? And so you, you did your two years and then, and then did you start right away getting, getting jobs or did, we, did you have to start going back and studying more and getting into different, more, no, I, I tell you, it's, uh, I went from there and then I, uh, I found myself, I was at Paramount Studios with an interview with Martha Coolidge at that time was mega hot director. She came out of the class. I got cast in the movie, some kind of wonderful right out of the gate. And I was like, all right, man, this is cool. And then they fired the director and fired the whole cast. So that was like, <laughs> welcome to Hollywood. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, and I remember I was there at uh, I was there at Paramount Studios on Melrose there, in the Lucille Ball wing because that's where you know Lucy and Desi Arnaz had their studio uh, offices originally, and it was just it was such a trip that uh, to be a part of that history, and then to have it thrown in my face you know <laughs> as a big as a big uh, rejection so that was kind of a bummer, but from that point on. I just started to get jobs. You know, I did a one line. I got my union card on uh, Say Anything. Okay. Say Anything was. Just so you uh, know, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. I quote it. I just watched it. No I, took way. Deep, I took a deep dive on you to find you. Like, I got to ah, find it. You're wearing the red shirt right at the party. I don't know. Maybe. You, I don't you, know. Gave, you gave your keys to the key, <laughs> key man. Key the man. Key yeah. The key master. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that was. I know that, everything about that movie, so. Ah, cool. Well, that was. Well, working uh, with Cameron Crowe, that's unbelievable. Cameron Crowe, yeah, that was that was really cool, and it was just it was one of those deals. You walked into the trailer at Universal, and it's like, okay, you, you, and you. All right, cool. And then Let's you walk go. out and got a call from uh, from my agent and said, yeah, you're going to be a part of this thing. That one line, I was there probably two months, and we shot in Pasadena. I was probably 21 and just made a boatload of money and it really was, it was amazing yeah because it's cool the, the business has changed i mean that was a big feature film yeah you know it was a big deal uh to be i know you jumped on the dog pile there you know you try to beat up the rooster or whatever it was awesome everybody <laughs> was there the and the guy eric stoltz eric stoltz is the rooster yeah he was a pa he worked as a pa on that film huh he was coming and knocking on your trailer and going, okay, they're ready for you. And they did the party scene in a house in Pasadena. And I'll never forget it because instead of shooting at night, they just put duvetine, which is like a black felt. They duvetine this whole million dollar mansion. Wow. And I was like, wow, this is a trip. So they could shoot the party day and night. It's like, it, just, wow. it never stopped. And I got there and, uh, the director of photography was Laszlo Kovacs, uh, super famous DP. I think he did uh, Easy Rider. He did a bunch yeah. of stuff. Oh, right on. You know, start, I mean, like the coolest dude ever. And I was always standing by the camera. And one day he's like, are you here again? What do you do here? What is your deal? <laughs> and I said, I like cameras, you know, because I, I was uh, taking pictures and stuff a lot at that time. And he taught me about lenses and about light. And, you know, I didn't do my line for weeks. We were there just drinking beer, playing Frisbee and hanging out with the chicks and just like. What a great yeah, set that must have been. Oh, it was great. It was great. And that was kind of the introduction to, to the career, really. But in I those mean, what days. Is, what, yeah, what, is, what, what is working with a guy named, a guy, a guy like Cameron Crowe or, you know, those guys, even Eric Stoltz back in the day that you now can look back on and say, what? What did they have, you know, and, and those guys are kind of iconic guys now. What was it about those guys? Did you glean anything from those guys that really made you go, I can do that? 
Yeah, not really. Not with those guys. That was kind of, I was a wide eyed kid in the candy store. I was just kind of looking at the lights like, wow. But I didn't think too much of them because they were kind of my contemporaries. Oh uh, yeah. And a, a lot of what I learned in this, in this class from this little Jewish woman is that you come out of this class and you're the best effing actor in town. The best acting you're going to see is in this room with your classmates. Wow. And she was right. We did some amazing work. So my head was up here and I was like, I'm here to kick ass. I ain't here to make friends. And um, uh, I just bounced from audition to audition. And, you know, you'd go to these meetings and, you know, you're giving the other dudes hard looks. It's like, dude, man, I ain't here to say hi to you. I'm here to freaking, <laughs> I'm here to stop you. You know, that was kind of the, you gotta feed the family, man. But, but later on, it, it, you know, there's other people that, that I learned a lot from. So now at this point, you're all in, I would assume, you know, you're, you're all in and I'm all in, I'm job. winning, I'm winning, I'm losing, you know, the big, the big break that I got was, um, I, uh, I read for LA story, uh, Another Steve movie. Martin movie, right. And I can quote uh, that one too. Mick Jackson was the director, amazing, amazing director. And this role was a guy who, he was a cross between James Dean and Marlon Brando. Steve Martin's character is walking to go see his girlfriend and he sees this guy in a hallway and he's talking to his girlfriend and he's saying, you know what, honey, I know I could be the champ if they would just give me a break. I know I'm the best middleweight in the planet. If I could just get a chance, if they would just believe in me, right? So then the next time Steve Martin walks by, my character saying, honey, I got a chance at the title. It's going off on this time. This is, this is everything I've dreamed of. And he's like, okay. So then the next time he walks by, my character's on a stretcher going, you know, I could have been a contender. I could have nice. been somebody, right? Nice. Hilarious, full page monologue. So I go out to Venice Beach to audition for this thing. Uh, Mindy Marin, who ended up casting me in Nash Bridges years later, but I read and the freaking director goes, yeah, I mean, finally we found the guy. This is freaking great, man. And it was, I think I was 22, just all ripped up, running in the hills. I mean, just the top of the top of my game. Big, you know, James Dean, Pompadour, the whole nine yards. I get invited to the reading. Wow. So I get there. Sarah Jessica Parker's there. John Lithgow is there. Steve Martin is there. The producers are there. And it's this huge table. And I'd never done a table read before. And I was just like, this is freaking mind blowing, right? <laughs> so I'm listening to the whole thing and going, this movie's funny, man. This is I cool. Love that movie. I didn't read a script, right? I love that movie. So we come to my part and I bust it out and I do the deal. Crickets, man, no laughs. And it's like, oh shit, okay, all right. So I'm feeling my way through, we get to the end. It's like, all right, cool, man. And I'm feeling like, okay, this is a little edgy here, you know? So I went to take a leak and freaking Steve Martin walks in. No, 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 I walked into the bathroom. Steve Martin was in there. I walked in and he's taking a leak. And I was like, do I ask to shake his hand? Do I say hello? And it's like, uh, I didn't know what to no say. No handshakes, no handshakes. You know, I didn't know what to say. So I went and I took a leak and he washed his hands and we was just kind of this odd kind of feeling. And I just took a leak and washed my hands and I left and I was like, shit, I should have said hello. I should introduce myself. But that's how antisocial I am. It's like, I had no business saying hello to the guy. And I hadn't learned yet that you have to kiss the boss's ass. You know, I was never, yeah. never been like that. And so I got back to my girlfriend's house and I found out that they said, no, they're not going to use you. They're going to use, uh, they're going to use Scott Bakula because Scott Bakula <laughs> was Steve Martin's friend and they oh, kind of looked alike. Yeah. And I was like, that sucks, man. And then I got a call from the director and he goes, look, I'm really sorry. He wants to use this fucking guy. I think it's wrong. I think it's, you know, bullshit, blah, blah, blah. But if you want to come down to the set, you could play Woody Harrelson's assistant, come down for the day, come check it out. We'd love to see you. So I said, great. I came down and, and did the day. And then the ultimate revenge was that they ended up cutting that part Thank God you said that, because I was trying to think of that. I'm thinking of that movie. I'm like, I don't remember any of this. I, that's fantastic. It was for a young, hot, James Dean, Brando, <laughs> badass, 
piss and vinegar type dude. There he is. And that was <laughs> not my, Scott Bakula. Right. And that was my attitude at the reading. And then it's this many years later, I, I still think, all right, I forgive Steve Martin, but if yeah. I see him, I'm going to kick his ass. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to walk into a bathroom one day, Jaime, and, right. and it's going to come full circle, man. He's, he's, and he was my hero. <laughs> he cut the albums. I had the albums. I had, I mean, he Wild was my crazy guy. Yeah, yeah. He was my freaking hero. And, but I learned that lesson. It's like, you know what? Just shake hands with people and be personable and meet people. But I didn't learn that till 25 years later, <laughs> but I did learn it eventually. You got to have a lot of confidence to, to, to be able to go in and audition and come out and get stuff and not get stuff. And right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it seems a lot like baseball to me, you know, you know, guys right. that are, guys that are hit, guys that hit 350 or 400 are the Kings of the castle, you know, and that's, right. Right. that's, a, that's a real, that's a real um, different thing that people have a really hard time with in general. And you're devastated. Kind of like but like you just said, to be in that business, you have to believe that you're the baddest, you know, MF or uh, on the face of the earth, right. you know, that's the bottom line. And, and uh, you know, my sister, when I, when I said I was going to be an actor, I'll never forget. My oldest sister said, are you crazy? There's a thousand people for every role. Only one person gets it. And I said, that's me, you know, yeah. that's just how it works. And then when I was in acting class, Joanne Barron, she said, look, I'm going to tell you something. Almost all of you people aren't going to make it. <laughs> None of you are going to work ever. The best work you're going to see is in this room and you're going to have a chance, but you need casting directors. You need producers, you need writers, you need directors. Maybe your place is in front of the camera. And I was like, Oh, that's me. I, I got that covered. I'm where did, where did that come from? I mean, was there, was there something that, that, you know, you can look back on in your, in your up, upbringing that, you know, that gave you that kind of confidence or that made you feel that way? Was it, I think a lot of that came from, from playing sports. You know, when I played, uh, when I played baseball, I was one of the best baseball players. My brother ended up playing triple a ball. Nice. You know, he was a great baseball player. My dad tried out for the Washington senators way back when, and they said, you're great, but we already have a Mexican. Sorry. Got one. You know? So he didn't make the team and that's what turned him really bitter. And he didn't support us in our dreams growing up. Um, but playing baseball and then playing Pop Warner, you know, with the Kings and the Monarchs, we were the best in the land, you know, five years of playing football. I lost one game. I went to St. Paul high school. We were, you know, state champions my junior year. And it was always about to be the best, you know, that was always my focus to be the best, you know, I'm faster than anybody I can catch. I can outrun you. I can, you know, out wrestle you. I'll out fight you if I have to, and I'll steal your girlfriend too on top of it. You know, it's like, that's who I am. And that's who we are, you know, and a lot of that training came from playing those sports and certain coaches that really inspired me. And also, you know, that work ethic that was ingrained into me because, you know, I'll be honest, I had no, no parental guidance growing up. I was like, I was riding a motorcycle. I was came home when I went, I left when I wanted, I made my own breakfast. I didn't see my, my mom when my parents divorced. She was gone because she got married when she was 16. So oh, wow. she was free for the first time in her life. So she was going out with her girlfriends, you know, doing her thing too. So the one thing that kind of grounded me was, you know, uh, surfing and, and playing football. And I was in such good shape too. We'd play football and I wouldn't even be tired after the games and stay out all night right. and go surfing at four in the morning. And it was just, I just had that mentality. That was just my mentality, but inside, to make it, you have to have that skin of a rhino and the heart of a child. Nice. Yeah. And that's, Great. that's who I am. You know, I don't let people get close to me. I just don't, I never have. And it's because of my upbringing, I guess, but that's how I've been able to protect myself, but I can always push and do. I mean, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a linear guy. Like I understand who the winner is at the end of the game. How do you, figure it out in a, in a business like acting? How do you know that you're the best? What, what, do, what is actors, how do they keep score? I don't know how everybody else does it. Uh, I can say that there are auditions that, oh man, I blew it. I freaking blew it. Oh man, Fuck. and I got the job. And other <laughs> auditions, it's like, I nailed it. Oh my God, I was freaking brand new. I couldn't have been better. Nothing, 
you don't hear anything. Yeah. So everything, the evolution of it, of where I'm at now, I just, I go to be the best that I can be. I prepare, you know, as hardcore that when I audition, I'm ready to shoot. I'm ready to shoot with Denzel, whoever, it doesn't matter. Right. When I'm doing auditioning uh, at home. And that's something this pandemic thing has taught me because everything now is self tape right? I light it myself. I shoot it myself. I read it with my wife and I just prepare like I'm going to set to make a movie. Right. So all I can do is all of my homework, all of my work, all of the presets, everything. And are, am I hitting those moments? And if it feels right, then I let it go and I just shoot it into the ether and it's gone. That's nice. You You talk, you talked a little bit about you know, being a, and, you know, an independent guy, being a guy who's kind of closed off. And did you have anybody that kind of coached you through the process when you were up and down in your, you know, just learning, learning your craft and really trying to manage the business? Not really, you know, not really. And that's, that's one thing about the business. It's, it's a very lonely business because if you have guys your own age, you're in competition and you score a big gig and they're, they're still, you know, working behind the bar, you know, it's hard to have those relationships. And I've, I've just tried to always try to just reevaluate and figure out where I am, you know, as far as uh, just having those meetings with myself, you know, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Wow. You know, um, probably in my forties, excuse me, as I started pushing 40, it's like the thing with drinking and partying. I was like, I can't do anymore. Right. Like I've done it all. (laughs) There's no more parties to go to that. I haven't been, you know what I mean? It must be great to have those experiences. What was it like, uh, you know, in the Canyon and, and, and in Hollywood and and (sighs) during those times, I mean, that must've just been a lot of fun to, to be involved in. You got any, got any good stories? That you're oh to. gosh! <laughs> there was a place, Mouses, off of Pico After Hours Club, that was ran by this dude, about six foot eight, black dude named Mouse, and it talked like this: "Are you here for football? <laughs> oh yeah, you gonna tell me what you're gonna drink? You know, you had to be when you went to the bar, you had to say, uh, give me a, a, a vodka cranberry on the rocks, sir. Here's my buddy, because any back talk anything, and uh, you know he'd throw you out. The soup Nazi, huh? Yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. Right. And the thing was, is that uh, I said, hey, boss, how you doing? He goes, you always call black man boss. And the room like stopped. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, when he's the boss of the establishment. You're all right, man. You're all right. Come on, man. What do you want? What do you want? And you could get anything from this guy, right? From this, from this place. But I was there and we were partying, we're drinking. And then the next thing I know, I'm sitting with Norman Mailer and his buddy, this Greek magnet. And we talked for hours and hours and hours. And uh, the thing that the Greek guy said to me before we left, because I was just getting hammered, right? And getting more hammered, you get more hammered and just, right? He says, whenever you go to a party, you leave the same way you showed up show up looking good glass of wine he goes you leave looking good with the half a glass of wine nice and i was like thanks man yeah (laughs) and you know years later it's like okay that's that's a good story yeah yeah let let the ice melt in your drink right you know (laughs) yeah sure sure. i mean there's so many stories like that and then uh you know every summer we'd go to we'd go to aspen to don's ranch uh, we'd go in July and then the show would start in August. So we did that for five years. And uh, Hunter Thompson was one of the writers of the show. Oh my God. Right? So we show up from LA. We're there, we're hanging out, just got a cocktail. And then I feel this dude on my shoulder. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, Hey, honey, what's going on, man? He goes, you look like you grew up. Looks like you spent some time in jail. <laughs> he starts laughing. I'm like, it's 11 and this dude's hammered. It's like, this guy's completely gone and hammered. He goes, who's this? I go, this is my mom. He's like, oh my God. Oh no, that's your mom. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He goes, I've got to go back to my house. He goes, you want to go for a ride with me? You want to go for a ride? And I'm like, 
oh man, so I, Hunter Thompson, we're in Woody Creek, Aspen, he invited me to go to his house, he had to go pick up a bag of something, and I was like, mom, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, you, you just hang out, we'll be back, right? So we get in the car and he's acting all insane. We get in the car and he takes off. He pulls out of the thing and we're driving down the road. And he goes, all right, over here. It's where I slid off the road and I hit that pole and knocked out the power for all of Woody Creek for two weeks. Couldn't get a goddamn truck out here to do it. And I was like, do I put on my seatbelt? Do I not put on my seatbelt? Am I going to offend him? What are and then I just, I just leaned over. I said, hey, man, I said, I've been working on some writing. I'd like to send you some stuff. Boom, he slows down in the car. Oh, really? What kind of stuff you've been writing? It was all an act. Totally just straight line. Hey man, Good. what kind of stuff you ride? Yeah, yeah, you can send me. Here's my email. Here's the car. Did it. We pull up to his house. <laughs> we got big uh, like vultures with glowing red eyes on the fence posts. <laughs> he leaves the car running. He goes, I'll be right back. I said, hey, Hunter, can I take your car for a ride? And he's like, God damn it, I got shotguns. Wait in the car. <laughs> runs inside, grabs his stash, comes, jumps in, and we head back to the party. But just stuff like that always happened. And then at three in the morning that night, we end up back at his house and he's handing manuscripts around. And it was from his book, Letters from the Road. Mm. Everybody had written him a letter. He wrote a letter back and he kept the, uh, the Xerox copy. So he put them all together and he had everybody reading it. Wow. And he's like, no, 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 it's the, it's and and the, it's like jazz. Doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. So we talk about writing. And he said, when you're reading your writing, it has to roll like jazz, it has to be wow. like music. The syncopation has to be. And then he would, he was in the middle of it, orchestrating, smoking a cigarette. Then he'd turn and go, Fadoom! and he'd flick his cigarette. And the assistant in front of the, <laughs> in front of the fireplace, like had it timed perfect where she would duck every time, Shoo! go right over her head. He'd light in there. <laughs> and it was like complete madness, complete madness. What was the first gig where you went, you know, this is big time. And this is, this is the one, you know, that's, that's going to send me over the top. Probably um, uh, 21 Jump Street was the first, that was like the hottest show happening um i went and read for a guardian angel <laughs> nice and um i was like i don't know about this and i told the director i said maybe i should read for the drug dealer guy and he's like no no read the guardian angel so i read it and this is the best thing that could happen to you you read you're leaving you're walking down the hallway and you hear a pitter patter and it's a casting director running out will you come back <laughs> come back and read will you read this other thing and it's like okay cool so i read the drug dealer i got that job and then i went <laughs> to uh vancouver for 10 days and shot there with with johnny and those guys and that was that was like a real show beginning i had a part that was beginning middle and end but i got back from doing that that gig and then i got back and then i booked uh uh, a movie for American Playhouse. Um, gosh, what was the name of it? La Carpa, the tent theater. That's one you can't get anywhere. Huh. But it was an amazingly beautiful story. And that it was, it was, I remember because I auditioned at the same place I auditioned for the LA story. Yeah. And the director wanted me to read the role of the friend who dies in the first 10 pages. And I was just like, no, nah, man, I ain't gonna do it. And he's like, <laughs> dang. What? He's like, I want you guys, I want you to read the Amito, the lead guy, you read that one and you read that one. And I was like, no, thanks, man. And he's like, huh. uh, all right, all right, wait outside. And they had the other guys read it. And then he came back and he's like, why do you, why won't you read for the other role? I said, I don't want to play the other role. This is the guy I'll read for. <laughs> and he was all like, yeah, nothing. the same look as you. He was like, okay. All or nothing. Yeah, all or nothing. And then I, I ended up booking that. And that was that was a big deal. We screened it at Universal, it was a thousand seat theater. And it was like, it went, it blew up. And that movie was supposed to go to the festivals and go around town, around the world. The guy got, the director got a three picture deal out of it. So he took the movie nowhere <laughs> and it never was released. So wow. nobody's ever seen it. So it kind of shot me in the foot, right? And then the same thing happened again. The next guy I did a movie with, 
Norberto Barba, who's a big executive producer now, Cuban guy. He did a, a thing uh, for Warner Brothers, and that was called Chavez Ravine, about where they built Dodger Stadium. Right on. Hmm. And those two movies, when I saw those on the screen, and they were both shorts, and I starred in both of them, I was like, fuck, dude. I'm on my way, man. It's like, <laughs> it did wonders for those directors. And the same thing happened with that. He got a three picture deal and he did nothing with the movie. To me, those were, they were hits, but they were misses because it didn't forward my career. Right. At that right. point, it, it, I was just doing, you know, I was doing show after show, but what it did do is it opened the door for me to read for uh, clear and present danger. Mm. Right. right on. Were you married at that point in time or were you? Were uh, you... I was married and I had uh, my girlfriend or. Yeah, she was my wife at that time, my first wife. So we got into this huge fight. She hid the keys to the car. Oh, man. <laughs> you're not going to this thing. You're staying home. You're doing this. You're doing that. I, I climbed out the window or something in our little studio apartment there by Melrose. <laughs> I ran down Santa Monica to the to the bus stop and I had bus fare for one way. I had just change, but I got out there to Santa Monica. I met Philip Noyce. The audition took about 10 minutes and then I was stuck in Santa Monica. And it was like, <laughs> now what do I do? So I was wandering around the third street promenade, found a slice of pizza, ate a slice of pizza off of, that some tourists had left on the table. <laughs> Seven months later, I get a phone call and my agent's like, you're leaving tomorrow. I'm like, what? You're leaving tomorrow, you're getting on the plane. And I said, for what? To play one of the ninjas. I don't know what it is. You just get your shit together. The car's gonna come pick you up, be ready to go. <laughs> and I was like, ninja, when did I read for a ninja? It's like, I have no freaking clue what this is. <laughs> and then they sent me a script and I was like, oh my God, I'm like, firing machine guns. I'm jumping out of a helicopter. We're flying through the valley. We're blowing shit up. We're doing it. And I'm like, oh my God, this is really cool, right? We flew to Mexico City, to Veracruz. And I was there for three months. And we were staying at this place, uh, this town called Coatepec, which was the first Spanish settlement in the 14, 1500s, right? They okay. built this huge castle and they converted right. it into a hotel, little town in the middle of nowhere. Right on. Coffee, cold coffee town. But we were there, Harrison was there, Willem was there, all our rooms were next to each other and you couldn't go anywhere. There's nowhere to go. You're out in the middle of the freaking jungle, right? And you'd be having dinner with Philip Noyce, with Mace Newfield, with Ralph Singleton, the biggest producers in Hollywood, yeah. with Stephen Zalian at that time, Donald Stewart, who was a buddy of Hemingway. Well, they were working on the script and I never forget it. We're having dinner, we're around. And I knew that getting a feeling for who Harrison was, I mean, that dude, he's freaking, he was the biggest star on the planet at that mm -hmm. point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Super cool dude. And um, we're having dinner and he, he keeps looking over at us. He's looking over at me and he's looking over at the other guy and he's there and you know, we're having a beer and I'm going, oh no, this is going to be bad. I see it coming. I see it coming because I knew we were going to rescue those guys. It's like, we're the heroes. And he's like, look, no offense, guys. He goes, there's no way anybody's going to pay $10 to see these freaking yobos come and rescue us. We got to rewrite this, Stephen. This is bullshit. How is this going to happen? And, and Phil Noyce is just like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Because after that dinner, uh, every time you get a rewrite, it's a different color page. Middle of the night, I get salmon color pages. Oh no, I'm dead. I'm going back home. This sucks. <laughs> then I get another page. Okay, I'm on the helicopter, but then what's that? Oh no, now I get blown up. And then it's like <laughs> everything was changing. And the next day I go to work and, he, and Harrison's like, of course we have an ending to this movie. It's a big Hollywood movie. No one knew what the hell was going to happen next. Wow. And I can't imagine just... even messing with a Tom Clancy book. I mean, those things are so well crafted. It's like, well, why would you even mess with it at all? That's craziness. Hey, man, that's movie the star rules. Uh... Those are movie star <laughs> rules. You know, oh, that's no. that's that's just how it works. So you got killed off on that? No, I got rescued. Okay. They rescued us. Oh, you, yeah, I see. <laughs> but we had it. We we're in the jail jail cell, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 
they're coming to rescue us. And Benjamin Bratt, who's a very thorough actor, right? He's got a thousand questions, thousand questions, right? <laughs> the director, Philip Noyce, just looks at him and he's just getting beaten by all sides, by the studio, by the producers, by, I mean, he's like, I mean, he was a shell of a man, literally. Wow. And he just looks at him just like, dude, just you're in the fucking jail cell. You just, <laughs> you know, do something, do your deal, yeah. you know? And he leaves, and he looks at me and he's like, Ugh. I said, I'm cool, man. So the guys that we worked with, the helicopter pilots, they went off and uh, uh, those are the guys that got shot down in Somalia, the Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. They were mm -hmm. those guys, right? Wow. So they showed me stuff. I mean, great, great group of guys, a big bummer what happened to it, but they showed me stuff of other guys that have been captured and stuff. So I, I really got into it. You know, I've had a thing where my lip was all swollen. I had them do my makeup. I had a black eye and I was all beat up and bloody and stuff. And I did bruising and, and, and that morning. So when we did the whole thing and they come in, boys, we're going home. It was like, yeah, right. And the camera comes and falls them in like this. And then I saw the camera go and then it just holds. And then he slowly creeps in like that. And I was just no words. And I was just felt all the relief of just God off my shoulders. It was like, yeah. and after the scene, it was like, okay, that felt good. I felt like I, I was doing some work with no words. Yeah. Get it. That's the key, right? <laughs> yeah. And then the next day, Harrison, he comes into the, uh, uh, well, the next day after we saw the dailies, we'd all see the dailies together, right? What was shot the day before he comes in and he's like, dude, you fucking nailed it, man. You just gave us our ending. You just nailed the movie, man. <laughs> he slapped me on the shoulder. And all the other actors were like, ah, you asshole. <laughs> How much, was, what was the budget on that one? I mean, just, just to give a. At that time, it was probably 80 million. Okay. Something yeah. like that. So that's you know? 300 million today. Cause that was yeah. the biggest movie around, wasn't it? I biggest mean, movie around. One of the interesting things that I heard uh, from, from some friends that, that are in the business and, and they said that we were talking about directors and they said that, the greatest directors have two things. They have experience and they have somebody that gives them great perspective, but, but, you know, to have somebody that is able to feed them perspective, God, it's just got to be, you know, a really important part of it. Is it something that you are talking about now? It sounds like that's what you're talking about. Sure. Sure. You know, having uh, seen the big picture and not getting caught up in the minutia, a writer needs a pen, but a director needs an army. Cool. Did you do a lot of directing in your career, I mean, how did you? I have, I have, I've done a lot. I've directed a few shorts. I've done some documentaries. I've shot a documentary on a singer songwriter. That was, I wrote it, I shot it, I lit it and I cut it, you know, for the most part. And then nice. I had a, an editor come in and, and do the finishing. But that's what I've all, I love making movies. It's like, that's the funnest thing to do. And one thing that I just kind of realized, and this is recently, I just shot a show for CBS uh, SWAT that's going to be coming out here in the oh, next nice. couple of weeks. Yeah, I did a nice little scene in there. But it was stepping back and not worrying about camera, not thinking about the light, not just doing my job, just do your job. Don't worry about the freaking thing. I don't need to talk to the cameraman. It's all still, I'm learning so much now that it's like so freaking cool, you know, that's that awesome. it's, it's an ever evolving thing. Was there, know? was there ever a time where you felt that light burn out a little bit or that light flicker? Was there ever any time where there was a crossroads for you in your career? Oh, sure. Sure. That's a great question. When I, I finished the Nash Bridges show um, in 2001, it should have been, it, well, it started out greatest time in my life this was the greatest thing ever right? right it was like i had a job right at that time when i got that job they'd actually cast somebody else and i was driving my car down fountain <laughs> smoke pouring out the back i'm like oh no pull over <laughs> park next to my other broken down car my 63 buick that's broken down <laughs> with parking tickets. And I'm just like, oh man, I don't know what's going on here. Same thing. I'd read for the show earlier and I'd read, met Don and uh, I get a call and they said, they want you to test for the show. Um, again, what show? What are you talking about? 
uh, for the uh, Don Johnson series. And I'm like, okay, well, when? When is the test? Um, tomorrow at CBS. And I'm like, what do you mean? Tomorrow. And it's like, well, there's sides? Is there a script? Is there no, just show up. Just go down there. <laughs> Wow. And I'm like, fuck, dude, I got no car. Yeah, this no is money. pre-Uber. No Uber, right? Yeah, there's not. Well, I couldn't afford it anyways. I was like, <laughs> oh, shit, man. What am I going to do? So I took off the next day and I ran down to Fairfax. When it, and I remember sitting in front of Warner Brothers and it was Christmas. And I was sitting on the bench waiting for the bus in front of Taco Bell. And then the tacos were like 39 cents. So I'm like, can't do it, dude. You need that for the ride. <laughs> And I'm just thinking, when's it going to be my turn, God? When's it going to be my turn? And thinking about all the stuff that I'd done, the movie that I did at Warner Brothers, that was such a big hit. I'm like, fuck, man, what's going on here? So I ran down to Fairfax. I got on the bus. We take off. Freaking guy, homeless guy, pulls a knife on the bus driver. I'm like, oh, no. The guy pulls over. He's like, everybody out the back. Get out the back. He opens the back door. I get out of the bus. We all filter out. I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, I got this, man. He's like, all right, stand back. And I'm like, I got to go. I got to go. I take off running out Fairfax. I get to the studio. The studio's closed. Oh, geez. Saturday, <laughs> right? I go up to the guard gate. No one's at the guard gate. So I just walk around the, the thing. I walk <laughs> up to the door. And I'm like, what the fuck? I go to touch the door and the door opens. I'm like, okay. I walk in. And then the guard comes around the corner. He says, yeah, can I help you? I said, I'm here for this test. He goes, follow the yellow line, the arrows. I go, All right. He goes to an elevator, press a button. There's a yellow dot. I get on it. Ooh, takes me down like five floors. I get out and it's like catacombs, man. There's just a yellow arrow. <laughs> and I'm walking around just going, this is getting freaky, man. I come around to the, to the studio, to the stage. Carlton Cuse comes out, who's now, you know, one of the biggest EPs in town. He's I mean, are a, you sweaty and everything from the jog? And like, are you like flustered or no? I'm a professional. I don't sweat that much. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer. Of all time. <laughs> but, uh, I don't sweat, man. <laughs> you know, I was feeling, I was like, you know, I had to keep my shit together. So I knew it was going to happen, right? Yeah, Something's yeah. going to happen here. So I'm, I'm just, you know, staying calm. And he goes, oh, hi, me. So great to see you. He goes, I want to introduce you. He goes, this is Kerry Tagawa, who played the original captain. And I see him. He's just freaking out. He's just like, <sighs> he didn't know what was going on. He's like, you guys are going to read this scene. And, uh, and it's going to be great. Don't worry about it. It's going to be great. And I'm just <laughs> like, I look at this dude. He looks at me. And like I said, he's freaking out. And I said, okay, let's read it. Let's read it. Let's read it. We're reading it. And I said, let's read it again. Let's read it again. And I'm just like, just let's have fun with it, man. Let's just read it. We just got it. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. We're doing it. And then we go in there and you walk out on the stage and it's like, okay. all you have is lights in your eyes. Mr. Gomez, can you turn it off, please? Like, uh, sure. <laughs> you know, you're like cattle, right? And I said, okay, uh, you have to start the scene now. And we start the scene and I just see Kerry Tagawa. He's just dying, man. He's just wilting. And I kept giving him his cues, but then I would throw in the top end of his line and then he would take off on it and riff on it. And then I would be back with him and then I'd be back there and then they're like, uh, thank you very much, wait outside. And then Carlton comes up and he hands me a monologue. And he's like, do this monologue, this is gonna be great. It's gonna be great. <laughs> I'm like, okay, but in this circumstance, there's no time to prepare. There's no time to be afraid. It's like, I'm here. This is what I do. I can do this. It's about a guy who runs into the thing and he accidentally shoots this cat and he's talking to the captain and he's blah, 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 right? So I just kind of looked at it and I said, all right, great. And he's like, you're ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. So I went in and I did the monologue and I heard a couple little titters, little giggles in the, in the thing. And they're like, all right, thank you. For, uh, you can leave now. Thank you very much. I left. I followed those dots. I came out. I sat on the grass there and I'll never forget it. I just laid on my back. And I said, God, man, when's it going to be my turn? I don't know, man. That was Saturday. I walked home. <laughs> I got home. My wife's like, what, what happened? My daughter was two at the time. And uh, I said, I don't know. I really don't know. And was just in a daze. Mm -hmm. That night we took the baby in the carriage. We walked down Melrose after everything was closed. I said, if I get this job, I'm going to buy you those $700 go-go boots. 
And she's like, yeah, right. <laughs> the next morning I got a call. Hi, mate, it's Carlton. Hey, buddy, want to uh, come to San Francisco and do the show? I'm like, uh, yeah, that would be great. I remember I fell to my knees. I was like, wow, that would be great. How much? <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, Can you send goes, a car? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he goes, yeah, we'll, we'll talk all of that with your agent. Great, man. We'll see you tomorrow. I said, okay, cool. Hung up the phone. I was like, I got the job, man. I got the job. She's like, no way. That was Sunday. They sent the car, picked me up. I flew out that night. I was staying in Union Square that night. The next morning I was in Treasure Island. We did a read. And then the next day I was doing a scene with Don uh, up on uh, <laughs> uh, like Signal that. Hill. Just like that. <laughs> I, had like, I had like 12 bucks in my bank account. I had $12. <sighs> Man. And we, when we got there that night, we shot that first day. Cheech was there and Julian Lennon was there because he was he was trying to pitch to do the theme song. And we went out to this crazy uh, bondage. A go go was one of the clubs that we went to there. And we're playing cards and shooting pool. And I was like, I can't bet. You know, I don't have any money. And I never forget. Don's like, chur, 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 chur. here's 500 bucks. Boom. Let's go rack them. Let's go. And I was like, Woo -hoo. but that story that turned into something great. And by the end, you know, my marriage was over. It was just like, we were like the Rolling Stones, man. It was just a full on party. And you know, when the party's over and it lasts too long, yeah. it was like, <laughs> I just want to get out of here, man. It's like, you know, Don was going through what he was going through. So I was stuck there in San Francisco. My kid was at home and it was all this stuff. But like you said, when did it waver? When I left that show after five seasons, I said, I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. This is oh, just wow. like, I should be high and I'm not. I feel miserable. Not because I left the show, just because the work wasn't fulfilling. Mm. And what it was is I'd, I'd lost my way of who I was right. and I was doing the work and making money instead of doing the work for me, which is the way I started the love of it, the love of it. I was like, that's it, man. I'm done. I'm going to just get sobered up, go surfing, hang out, you know, made some money. And then I got the call for training day. And I was like, okay, cool, man. I'm ready to do training day, man. I'm just like, I'm on top of it. I'm sharp as an arrow. Boom. Now we're going to do features. And uh, that was another amazing, amazing experience. You know, the guy who was best buddies with the director of training day, he was the one who trained me as a cop for Nash Bridges. Hi, I mean, can I ask you a little bit? Of, a little bit of, I mean, what what happens on a set when you know, like a Nash Bridges? You know, it, it's got to be star studded. You know, there's a lot of guys that you know, Cheech and and you know, obviously Don Johnson has a long history of stories that even I, as the outsider, have heard about. And was it wearing on you in that? way as opposed to just the party lifestyle was it wearing on you you know by the personalities and the, and the way that people acted and well you know it's like everybody knows those stories and i knew those stories too but between cheech uh jeff perry and myself and don we were the four we started the show and mm -hmm. we went to five seasons they did another a few episodes after that or did another season after that but Don was so freaking cool and took care of us like it was five star, bro, all nice. the way, all That's the way. Great. And it, it wasn't because of that. I was just tired and just done. I was I wanted to be home. I missed my kid and I wasn't happy with me. That's that's essentially what it was. Gotcha. Uh, and when I left, you know, I shook his hand and thanked him for everything because it's like he took care of me and my family. Right. It was just top of the line dude all nice. the way across yeah that's cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah that that must have been a lot of fun i, I know that uh, those shows that we lived watching the show you know i we thought that was uh, thought it was a cool fun show to watch yeah it's one of the old classic tv formulas you know and it was one of the last shows to shoot on film you know and oh. it was really oh, an expensive great. an expensive show and when we started it he said look he goes you're going to film school for five years man he goes, you learn what everybody does, learn about lenses, lights, cables, pre-production, post-production, go hang out with the editors, go see what the writers are all about. Neat. And that's what I did. He goes, cause you know, he goes, we're not, and he was very honest. He goes, you know, there's some days I'm not going to work. It's that simple. 
Mm. He goes, but you're getting paid to not work. Oh, right on. And it was like, that's a good way to put it. You yeah. know, how, how much can you bitch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, Jaime, I was, uh, I, I was, when I was going through the deep dive and, you know, training days on the list, you know, I own that movie on, on iTunes and uh, movies are so freaking powerful. It must've been quite a departure from doing a series. And then your very next thing is one of the most powerful movies of the decade or the, or the sure. year, whatever. I mean, it must've been, is it hard to switch gears with that kind of depth? Do you, do you get out of shape? TV is fast. Okay. It's, it's lightning. It's lightning fast. It's like my wife will put on Ash Bridges, you know, and we'll be watching it. And I'm like, this show's great. I've never seen this before. This is like amazing. I said, I don't even ever remember being there and doing that scene. And she's wow. like, how can you not remember that? Right. And the reason is, is because you're moving so fast and you might do one take. And they might give you the rewrite right before you do it. Or they go, you know what? We have nothing. We're going to shoot this scene right now. We're going to set it up. Let's go. You get in the van, you go to the pier, boom, boom, boom. You shoot it. And then you're on to the next thing. And it's going so fast that you don't have a chance to get into it. Now, the thing with movies, well, TV, you shoot 10 pages a day, 11 pages a day. That's how fast you're working. And Versus what would be how many pages in a movie? Like a page and a half. Oh. Okay. I had no idea. You know? So you, you got time to cruise and to think that's why, you know, someone like De Niro, he can do, he can do it five different ways. He can do it seven different ways. They have the time, they have right. the luxury being on a training day set. It is just like a Nash set or clear and present. Day. It's like, that's, this is where I belong. Hmm. You know, I was in Vegas last year and just walking to the casino with my wife. Hey, you're the guy from Trinity Day. No way, bro. What's going on, dude? Yeah. We take a picture. It's like, right. okay, you know, <laughs> it's like that. That movie really, really moved people, and and that was one of those experiences too. Where when I got cast in that movie, I got a call, um, and that happened again seven months later after the original reading. I read for some another part, then I read for another part. And then uh, they brought me back for this guy and I played Ethan Hawke's role and read the script with Denzel. And nice. we just did a table read and we did it for Antoine to record it because they shot it. It was the first time they ever shot the whole movie on a computer because they had to get the, can the shadows right because okay. it takes place in a day. Right, right, wow. right. One day. Remind me which came first. Did Training Day come first or Crimson Tide? Because you work with Denzel twice. Crimson Tide came first. Yeah. Then was there any connection the second time around? Did we didn't mention it. He just kind of looked at me and I looked at him and it was like, sup, Lonzo? What's up, dog? <laughs> oh boy. And it was like, you know, I'm King Kong. <laughs> yeah. There's no like, hey, did you see the game, bro? What's up? Did it? Yeah. You know, there was none of that. You just start you in know, the mode, huh? That's it. Just show up and just that's who that's you are. Yeah, I thought it? there was this whole, I thought there was this whole like palling around business and okay, lock in. I mean, I guess it's method, right? I mean, you, it depends. It depends degree. what, what your relationship is. You know, what is my relationship in that movie? He's the boss. I want to be him. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't think twice about putting a bullet in his head. Right. So it's like, that's, you know, as an actor, I want to be Denzel and right. be doing the movies he's doing. So I had that kind of mentor relationship and that's mm -hmm. what I played. And that's how I, I kept it. You know what I mean? And you do, you call him Alonzo the whole time you guys are shooting? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. I've heard of that. That's the thing, though, too, is when we did in, in uh, Crimson Tide, that's when you're talking about things I learned. It's like that dude's prepared, man. He's like on it, dude. Yeah. He knows his two-page monologue, top to bottom, bottom to front. He's ready to rock. You know, nice. that, that great scene when... Denzel and uh, and um, and Gene getting the argument, the Lippins honors and all that yeah. stuff. You Portugal know. and Spain, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, Mr. Hunter! And he screams at him and all that shit. Well, that day they cleared the set and, uh, you know, being the guy I was, the officer of the deck, I talked to the real skipper of the USS Alabama and I said, you know, what, am, what is my role? What is my deal? What do I do? And he goes, well, when the, when the commander leaves at the deck, you have you have the con. You yeah, have you're control the con. One SQ, you're, baby. Yeah, you're the man, right? <laughs> so that's what I told you. Whenever he left, I'd go stand on his mark, and it was like oh, <laughs> all the lights, like 
just <laughs> freaking perfect, right? Yeah. But that Did was guys, one of the when mm, they're talking yeah. about the Limpenzomers, there was there was this racial component that I felt because they talk about well, yeah, totally. well, they were black when they were born and they're white, you know. Was that something that was talked about, or is that just an uh, interesting little thing that happened? That was Tarantino, he... man. Oh, is that right? Tarantino did some rewrites for that. Yeah, it does sound like Tarantino when you say it that way. Yeah, yeah. and he's like, when when uh, Gene Hackman goes, "Oh, I didn't know that." It's yeah, like yeah, dude. There's a lot you don't know. I mean, it was it was so heavy. But when we did when we went to shoot that scene, they cleared everybody from the set. And I asked Tony Scott, I was supposed to be there seven days. I ended up being there like three months. Right. Okay. And I asked Tony Scott, I said, Hey man, can I come up? Uh, or first I asked him, I said, can I come to dailies? And he's like, uh, he goes, look, he goes, dailies are at 6am every day. Sit in the front row. Don't be late. If you're late once, or you say one word, you're not invited back. Right on. And I was like, yes, sir. So I was there at 545 every morning, sitting in my seat, just like, right, watching. And uh, Don Simpson, Jerry Bruckheimer yeah. were there, you know, and they were doing their whole thing. So I watched them shoot that whole thing. But when it came time to shoot that scene, cleared the set. Only Denzel and him. I said, oh, I can I, I said, can I, can I come and see the set? And he goes, he goes, I'm nervous, man. He goes, I'm nervous. And I was like, what? He goes, I'm fucking nervous, man. I said, that's all right, bro. I said, I'll be with you, man. I'll go with you. And he just laughed and he's like, yeah, let's go. So then we went out, was on a big gimbal, uh, like yeah. 30 feet off the ground and stuff. And that's uh, funny you said that about Tarantino, because it sounds exactly like true romance when uh, when the I can't think of this with the guy's name. Uh, Dennis Hopper is talking to the, the Guidos. It's exact same kind of banter. Like they mm -hmm. shouldn't be talking like that. This right. is a very intense time and they're talking about horses. You know, that's a total Tarantino deal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you told me that. I really appreciate that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one of his, one of his starts, you know, and you got, it. and you got Vigo Mortensen in that movie. You got James Gandolfini. I mean, talk about yeah. sluggers. There's some sluggers yeah. all over that thing. Yeah. You know all over I mean? that scene. Rocky Carroll was another one. Uh, and a funny thing is, is Lilo Brancata who played the radio man, Remember oh, yeah. we got hit and he got, he yeah. got Jack. We're trying to get through. We got to get the one SQ to it. He's doing all that. That's Scotty more got, power. Yeah. He's the guy who got the job in Nash bridges. He got Poor the him. Evan. <laughs> it was Evan Rydell. He got okay. the job in the last minute. He bailed out. That's wow. why I got cast like that. Yeah, wow. man. That's classic. Yeah. Funny how, yeah, funny how those should. things go. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, I, I, we could probably drag a hundred thousand stories out of you. Jaime, and I appreciate you <laughs> taking the time. I'd love to get into, before we leave, uh, I'd love to get into a little bit of Gus. Cause that to me, that's a, that's a story that is really interesting to me. And, and it, and it seems like it's such a, an iconic kind of a character and story, um, you know, and, and it's true and, and all those kind of things. Tell us a little bit about that and just give us a little bit of a synopsis on that and, and, sure. and where you're at with that whole thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, Gus Garcia, it's a story, a legendary uh, civil rights attorney who, who was the first Mexican-American to argue a case on the floor of the Supreme Court right on. Uh, and win. Um, he was somebody that was fighting racism and segregation in the 90s and 40s and 50s at a time when uh, this part of Texas history where they were lynching Mexicans left and right. A lot of those Southerners came from the South came to Texas and established their Jim Crow laws there in Texas. Um, he was a guy that um, his mother raised under a very strong mother who made him and taught him to speak perfect English so he could excel. And he was very light skinned like I am. And he was able to, uh, uh, he graduated the first, the valedictorian of his high school and they wouldn't allow him to go to the University of Texas because he was Mexican. And he told this amazing story that, you know, he would have the story in every newspaper because his brother worked for the newspaper and he bullshitted the principal and the principal got scared and let him go to UT where he graduated the first his class. And it huh. turns out the story is his little brother was just a paper boy. So he had a way of. Uh, he was in the business. <laughs> he was in the business. I mean, this guy had a silver tongue and uh, he became this uh, incredible lawyer. This guy went from Texas. He, he came out to Westminster, California, which was the KKK capital of California at that time. And he, he desegregated the schools by bringing up this little Mexican girl who they said, because of pedagogical differences, 
Mexicans couldn't learn. And this girl knew Latin. She could speak Latin. She could speak English. She could speak Spanish. She was wow. so intelligent. The judge was just like, this is bullshit. Yeah, right. <laughs> he segregated the schools here. He took that argument back to Texas, did the same thing, uh, Bastrop versus the Vo Board of Education. And I met a senator in Austin, Texas, who said one day he was going to school. He's working in the fields, going to school at a, at a schoolhouse with no windows and no books. He goes, the next year I was with the white kids and I was learning how to read. And I became a senator because of Gus Garcia. Wow. It's like the stories run so, so deep and it touches me and it's close to my heart because my parents, my family's from Texas and they grew up picking cotton in Texas Man, huh. freaking hard, hard life. Um, but this guy, he did that. And then uh, he ended up um, <clears throat> helping the farm workers and changing the conditions for the farm workers and literally calling out the Mexican Business Association, because he said, what you have down the road here is Auschwitz. All right. And y'all can't turn around and tell me that you didn't know about it because I just told you. So he became kind of a prior within the community. He changed their living conditions. And the radical thing is, is when he was giving a speech on the back of a flatbed Ford, who was in the audience? Little Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez, yep. Cesar yeah. Chavez came to LA you know, started that whole movement the, uh, with, uh, uh, with the farm workers union and all that stuff. All that was inspired by him. All those lawyers came out here. Uh, that was one thing he, uh, Fidel Castro and his brother came to New York and sent him a letter. They wanted him to be his translator, their translator, because Fidel Castro was trying out for the New York Yankees. Oh, right. And, uh, you know, Gus Garcia said, you know, if he could just hit a curveball, you know, things would be different. You know? <laughs> so this guy, he touched so many lives. And then he took this guy that was a, a just a dirty dog of a dude, this guy Hernandez, who killed this guy in a bar fight. He left. And this guy Hernandez, he had a peg leg. He his parents, you know, didn't love him. The church, the priest would make fun of him. He would pee his pants. He was the town drunk. And this guy made fun of him and he went home and got his rifle and the gun accidentally went off and he killed this guy. Well, yeah. they were going to kill him and Gus decided to represent him and no one could understand why. And the whole reason was Gus recognized that every jury consisted of white Christian males. Yeah. And he said, so much this, for your peers. Yeah, this is something here. And he argued it all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, they ended up giving him 16 extra minutes, which has never been done in the history of it. The night before he went out, was partying with Billy Holiday in a jazz club. We got, you know, <laughs> he showed up all hung over the next day. So he's a guy who battled his demons while fighting for the little guy. And he did everything he could to help others, but he couldn't help himself. Oh, wow. It's, <laughs> it's a powerful, powerful story. And uh, we've got a great script. And, when did he uh, pass, I Jaime? Mean? He died penniless and alone on a park bench in 1964. I think it was 64. Okay. Yeah, because wow. we're not, yeah. I'm not, I don't know. I'm a history teacher for Pete's sakes, and I do not yeah. know this story. The story of Gus Garcia is amazing. And he was a JAG officer in World War II. He was an attache with Douglas MacArthur. He was there when they signed, when the Japanese surrendered. I mean, wow. every like these points in history. Oh, that's the Forrest Gump deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I met these guys, they introduced it to me, these writers, and they had a script that wasn't, it was just, it was, it wasn't a movie. It was like a play. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and then I found out they didn't even own the rights. So I ended up pursuing the rights to this thing. And then I found out the guy who had the rights didn't really have the rights and these legends of the story lived in San Antonio, Texas. So I raised some money and I went out there and I walked in his shoes for three months, hung out with the homeless in the park, went to the hotels where he met JFK and Robert Kennedy and they wanted him to be a part of, of their administration. And, uh, and I wrote this incredible script and we've done readings, been shopping it around town. And where we're at now is I found I was introduced to a, uh, an investment group and uh, the guy, somehow I got this meeting with this guy and I, I just said, look, you know, there's no point in me telling you anything about the story unless you read the script. 
you know, uh, Latinos account for two and a half billion dollars of box office annually. Yeah. And we have no content. And he was like, okay. He goes, I used to work at William Morris. He goes, I used to read scripts all day long. I said, great, read the script. And if you're interested, let me know. So he read the script and he absolutely loved it. And then I gave him all the, you know, the breakdown. You guys see it in the, in the package that I sent you. Right. And uh, he's like, I'm in, let's find a distribution deal. You know, so he's willing to finance the movie. I got to find a distribution deal. And, uh, you know, if it was that easy, I would have done it already. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's all about that juggling act. It was almost happened over at Sony. And then the pandemic hit. And then my guy at Sony, he left and he's at Amazon. Well, Amazon's not making movies. Oh, Netflix man. is not doing movies. They want a series. So I, I wrote it. I wrote a 10 part series for it. So we're still dancing around with it and it's going to take that one domino to fall. And then. Well, it's, it's been great that you shared like you did. And I, I, I really appreciate it. I think I told you a little bit about this. You know, we, we, we kind of came to this podcast based on, on the COVID and the, and the lockdown, the shutdowns and, and not having, having nothing but really bad news coming all the time. That's all sure. that was being flooded the airways. And so we said, let's talk to, let's talk to people that are inspiring, you know, right. that, that have real lives that have gone up and down and that, but we know that they have an, a, a message and, uh, and you didn't disappoint. I mean, it was a twinkle like, in the just, eye, baby. Yeah, it was oh, fantastic. That's cool, man. I, if you, if you don't mind us taking a few minutes, we do a speed round at the end where we ask you a couple questions and you kind of throw out some answers and, uh, and we'll Love finish it. up with that. And uh, that would be cool. Cool. Re ready to go, Tom. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, things every young actor should know, or one thing every young actor should know. Quit. <laughs> Make room. Yeah. Just that's every, every, and I've said this to, you know, kids with their parents and with everybody, you know, I want to be an actor. What's your advice? I said, fucking quit. Right. Quit. Because if you don't believe you're the guy, if there's this much of a doubt, quit man you know? that's amazing yeah mm -hmm. you, if you have to do it then you have to do it and you know that real quick you know when Got you're it. eating hot dogs and rice for christmas right <laughs> a cup of noodles baby <laughs> if you had um if you had bezos money what would you spend it on to make your country or your community stronger i'd make gus <laughs> nice <laughs> right on. you know i, I we... wanted to say about i wanted to say about <laughs> gus like i <laughs> I was under the impression because of so many remakes out there in Hollywood and all that, like, I didn't know there was any more stories to tell. And that's so cool because I think you mentioned that, like, you know, this is the greatest story you never heard. And I just, I can't wait. I can't wait for it to go. I'll send you a script. If you want to read a script, man. Right on. <laughs> that's good to me. Awesome. All right, let's do the speed round. Now the speed round is just fast. First thing that pops in your head. I'm a psychology teacher. So just the first thing that pops in your head, I'm going to give you two choices and you just pick one. Sound and good? then we'll get you out of here. And then you're out, man. All right. Elvis or Jerry Lee? Oh, Elvis. Beatles or Stones? Oh, probably Beatles. Chuck D or LL Cool J? Mm, don't uh, think, just do. Probably LL. <laughs> I don't know why, but. Ford or Chevy? Chevy. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Whiskey or tequila? Yes. Android <laughs> or iOS? What is that, a phone? Yeah, phone. Apple or Android? Uh, I don't really know, to be honest with you. So I'm just, Motorola you know, flip phone, baby. Phone. Motorola flip phone. <laughs> Hello, Moto. That's a, I think I have an Android. I think it's okay. an Android. Right on. <laughs> Baseball or football? Oh man, that's a tough one. Uh, I love football, but probably baseball. Blonde or brunette? Uh, a brunette. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. I told you, we got to stop asking guys ask, asking that question. Asking married guys. <laughs> you guys look around before they. Ask yeah, I was like, <laughs> my wife's a brunette. No, it's gotta be a brunette. J Lo or Selma? Oh, Selma. Batman or Superman? Selma. Uh, Superman. World War II or Vietnam? World War II. And the last one, Vince Scully or Chick Hearns? 
Oh, that's unfair, man. <laughs> oh. Only LA guys would know. <laughs> oh, man. You got to be chicky, baby. All right. <laughs> Sounds good, man. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, man. Hey, man. Uh, I mean, thanks, you, man. I, I, it's, it was great to, to share, share, have you share and, and, uh, and just to spend a little bit of time and catch up like that. And, uh, sure, man. We will, uh, we will get, uh, we will get this edited up and, uh, and, and, uh, and get it up. I'll shoot you a text, uh, right before we put it out. But, uh, and one of my other great coaches was Chuck Willick. <laughs> Chuck coached you? Yeah. You know, I wish, I wish I, I would have known, I wish I would have I sure. wish I would have known something back then. You know, I, 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 we tell the story, Tom and I talk about it all the time. You know, I coached that one year and then I didn't coach for a couple of years. And then I came back and Tom was in the class of the first class that I started yeah. my 30 year run. Really? And, I, and I didn't, I didn't know shit. You know, I, I was a player. I didn't, you know, I was one of those guys who thought, you know, well, you just go out and fucking, you know, holler and get after it and fucking get everybody fired <laughs> right. up. And, you know, you and I just, we both you know, got coached just, by this guy. That's classic. Yeah. That yeah. is funny. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's great to, uh, again, reach back to those connections where, you know, we did get to spend a moment in time together and, uh, you know, that's, yeah. that's always neat. And, uh, yeah, there's cool. always a little bit of a, of a cool connection to, to get a chance to catch up and, and find right. out what everybody's doing and stuff like that. So, sure, sure. I mean, do you have links and stuff? Did you send Chuck some links and stuff that we can put on the YouTube stuff where they can yeah, get Yeah. Yeah. I send you a couple of movie links and yeah, I got, I got all, I got all the stuff. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll put them in the, uh, We'll put them in and uh, and and let people click and uh, there's a we, cool need, we need all we need all the subscribes that we can get too okay yeah yeah if you well, got ten emails you gotta do ten <laughs> yeah, let me know when it's when it's coming up and I'll blast we'll it on do. the Ash Bridges oh, page that, and the other page and all that cool. stuff you know that is awesome. I can do. man thank you all right, so man. much it means a lot oh, peace all brother right, yep all right man good to talk to you take care yeah you take too care. man right, God buddy. bless.